Item number SCP-7000 Object Class Thalmio Special Containment Procedures All usage of SCP-7000 should abide by regulations described in Ethics Committee Protocol Fern Flower. Description SCP-7000 is a foundation-produced communication method by utilizing various mimetic suggestions through plain text. SCP-7000 diminishes the retroactive generation of anonymous phenomena in baseline reality. Since SCP-7000's implementation, the general danger and hostility imposed by newly discovered anomalies has decreased by approximately 60%. Current instances of SCP-7000 do not completely prevent the existence of malevolent and irrepressible anomalies, although most now follow currently documented anomalous laws. This has made overall containment and research significantly easier. An increase in beneficial and benevolent anomalies, as well as more concisely written SCP documentation. See attached document for further details. Has also been noted alongside these changes. Discovery Log SCP-7000 was created following an increase in retroactive reality alterations detected by the FRCN, Foundation Reality Wide Communications Network. In one week, a higher amount of newly discovered anomalous phenomena were reported, most in some way relating to the concept of luck. The Department of Memetics and Pathophysics were able to produce and successfully employ SCP-7000 during this time. Due to the immense level of harm such entities presented, SCP-7000 was originally intended to neutralize those responsible through lethal memetic hazards. This decision was later revised upon confirming the possibility of a set k class reality failure scenario. An alternative, non-lethal form of mimetic suggestion was then created, which successfully nullified the influence of numerous entities. Despite being approved by a majority of leading Foundation personnel, the Ethics Committee expressed dissatisfaction, opting for a clear physiological evaluation of these entities before further use of SCP-7000. Two months postponement was approved and access to a majority of Foundation documentation for psychological study was granted. An initial set of newly improved memetic agents were finally produced using the Ethics Committee findings as a basis. These were intended to reduce hostile anomalous activity whilst retaining favorable standing with these entities until means of clear communication could be developed. This proposal was finally agreed upon by all leading Foundation personnel after the latest SCP-7000 instance proved the most effective. A log of currently utilized instances can be found below. Warning! Potent memetic hazards ahead! The following is a list of SCP-7000 instances that have proven the most effective against pedophysical entities. SCP-7000 Instance Log Instance Number 4 Message Please take regular breaks. Instance Number 9 Message Go drink some water. Instance Number 15 Message Call your grandparents. Instance number 59, message. There's a fine line between passion and obsession. Never go too far. Instance number 75, message. It may not feel like it, but you've done enough for today. Just forget all about it for now. Instance 158, message. Talk to someone, anyone, please. Instance 159, Message. Seriously, it's a community. Go make friends. Instance 241. Message. Only a nobody would hurt you for not finishing. 
Instance 436, message. Don't torture yourself. Instance 972, message. Always ask yourself, am I having fun? Instance 3046, message. Do something else will clear your head. Instance 7000, message. The number doesn't make the article. You give the number value. Don't let it consume you. Item number SCP-7000, Object Class Safe, Optic Thalmu, Special Containment Procedures. All remaining 40 instances of SCP-7000 are currently stored within High Security Anonymous Document Containers within Site-19. All personnel accessing any SCP-7000 instance must have completed Level 4 Tactile Cognito Hazard Training and be equipped with standard issue anti-tactile cognito hazard equipment. Use annual testing of any SCP-7000 instance requires direct approval of both the Site Director and the Ethics Committee. Update 15th of November 2010 Due to increased frequency of containment breaches at Site-19 since 2000, and the importance of SCP-7000 as a Foundation asset, all remaining 40 instances of SCP-7000 are to be stored within High Security Anonymous Document Containers and temporarily held at facilities on a rolling basis. Upon Elaine Vital Energy EVE levels reach five times the regional baseline, SCP-7000 is to be relocated immediately via secure transport. Description SCP-7000 consists of a set of 46 update 40 playing cards. The cards are printed on a typical card stack of the mid-19th century using an otherwise non-anomalous combination of inks. No manufacturer label or mark is printed on any SCP-7000 instance. SCP-7000's effects occur when an individual makes direct skin contact with any instance of SCP-7000. Upon contact, causality and probability are altered through an unknown mechanism. Detectable increases in regional EVE background levels have been noted to occur following SCP-7000's activation causing the individual to experience increased negative life events. These events include, but are not limited to, occurrence of traumatic or accidental injuries, onset of chronic or terminal disease, significant personal monetary loss and other financial hardships, dissolution of stable social connections and relationship loss, occurrence of natural disasters in areas of residence, Death. The magnitude of this effect is directly proportional to the duration of contact with SCP-7000 and the value of the SCP-7000 instance contacted. Instances of SCP-7000 traditionally holding higher value in Western card games. Aces, Kings, Queens, Jacks, etc. have been noted to cause more severe effects. A notable exception of this trend occurs when an individual simultaneously contacts the Ace of Spades, the Ace of Clubs, the Eight of Spades, and the Eight of Clubs, resulting in the most severe effects SCP-7000 has demonstrated to date, usually instantaneously. No difference in effect has been noted between SCP-7000's different suits. Additionally, SCP-7000's effects appear to be commutative. Individuals exposed to SCP-7000 multiple times, or multiple individuals exposed to SCP-7000 simultaneously, have been observed to receive more severe effects. Testing has revealed that anomalies that similarly alter causality are capable of negating SCP-7000's effect. Anomalies tested include SCP-181, SCP-1968, SCP-3460, SCP-BEEP, currently uncontained in Havana, Cuba, 
believed to be in the custody of Fidel Costo's descendants. SCP Beep, currently uncontained in Moscow, Russia, reports indicate the object may have been neutralized following the collapse of the Soviet Union. SCP Beep, currently believed to be in the custody of DC Alfine, the Under Security General of the Global Occult Coalition. Likewise, just Thing has revealed that the effects of an SCP-7000 instance are transferred to any document in which at least 20 micrograms of an instance of SCP-7000 is embedded, with this effect permeating upon removal of the instance fragment. The proposal is to create additional instances of SCP-7000 for testing purposes are currently approved on a case-by-case -case basis. Addendum 7000A Discovery SCP-7000 was first brought into Foundation containment in 1990 following a series of defections of Pentagram, operating name for the United States Paranatural Warfare Command operatives. Recovered documents from Pentagram records indicate SCP-7000 was originally discovered in Deadwood, South Dakota by ASCI, American Secure Containment Initiative, a precursor organization to the modern SCP Foundation, agent in 1879 following the town's destruction, it is unknown to extend the ASCI utilized SCP-7000 during the period that followed. As such, records are lost during the assimilation of multiple ASCI assets by the Pentagram. SCP-7000 was utilized extensively by Pentagram operatives throughout the Cold War, where it was deployed as a cognito hazard against U.S. targets both domestically and abroad. The extent of this utilization resulted in the full consumption of six SCP-7000 instances during this time. Aces of Hearts and Diamonds, King of Spades and Hearts, Queen of Hearts, and Jack of Clubs. With only 40 SCP-7000 instances surviving upon Foundation acquisition, attempts to determine which, if any, historical event were potentially due to the United States government's utilization of SCP-7000 are ongoing. Records suggest the highest utilization of SCP-7000 within the Soviet Union and its allies occurred between February 1960 to October 1962 as well as December 1980 to April 1986. Successful containment of several SCP-7000 fragments located throughout the former Soviet Union shortly after the foundation acquisition of SCP-7000 Lends credit to these reports. Pentagram records also suggest high domestic use upon political targets within the United States between March 1963 to November 1963, as well as June 1979 to May 1981, though these accounts remain unverified. Addendum 7000B Object Class Update as of March 3rd, 2010, following successful utilization of SCP-7000 instances by MTFs, Gamma-13, Osmoth's Lawbringers, Delta-5, Frontrunners, Iota-10, Dam Veds, Lambda-14, One Star Refuers, Mu-3, Highest Bidders, and Alpha-1, Red Right Hand. Within field operations, SCP-7000's object class has been updated to Thalmu. Field utilization has included, but has not been limited to, inclusion of SCP-7000 particles within letters and other correspondence. Embedding SCP-7000 particles into business cards offered by front companies. Embedding SCP-7000 particles into clothing tags of POIs. Deployment of SCP-7000 particulate into GOI building filtration systems. This method was noteworthy for use prior to the containment of SCP-1609 and Operation Falcon Punch. 
due to the increased MTF operative turnover since 1995, training in the tactical use of SCP-7000 is offered on an as-needed basis. Addendum 7000C, Incident, SCP-7060, Level 4 Access Required, Access Granted. On July 5th, 2016, 12 agents of MTF Alpha 1 defected to the Global Code Coalition, SCP-7000, as well as three other SCP objects were stolen and brought to GOC custody. It is currently unknown if SCP-7000 has been destroyed via standard GOC procedures. Protocols to shield critical SCP Foundation personnel from possible cognito hazard attacks from SCP-7000 are to remain in place indefinitely. Attempts to relocate SCP-7000 fragments released within Foundation facilities as part of former intra-Foundation operations launched by MTF Alpha-1 are currently underway. Proposals for containment and or neutralization of SCP-7000's lingering effects on SCP Foundation personnel are under review by the Foundation Ethics Committee. You quickly turn on the computer in front of you, your hands shaking with fear. You type in your credentials as fast as you can. Thank God Skipnet is still online. Item number SCP-7000, Security Level 1, Containment Class, Uncontained, Disruption Class, Amida, Risk Class, Critical. Special Containment Procedures, SCP-7000 is currently uncontained. Description, SCP-7000 is a currently ongoing anomalous event. SCP-7000 began at midnight on January 1st, 2023. When several sinkholes ranging from 2 meters to over 500 meters in diameter began rapidly forming around the world in major population centers, most notably in the exact geographic centers of the cities of Tokyo, Shanghai, London, and Cairo. At 1200, thousands of anomalous entities began emerging from all sinkholes formed during SCP-7000 causing worldwide panic and disarray. These entities designated SCP-7000-A instances of variable in appearance, though are typically pink or red in coloration, are slightly larger than an average human, and are octopedal. Instances possesses no heads or notable structures besides legs and abdomens, and vaguely resemble large spiders. Instances are hostile to humans and have been shown to attack on sight with intense force, often resulting in fatality for the victim. Reading this again, you shudder at the thought of the horrifying creatures that now roam outside. You can still hear them. You're the only one left in the entire sight. And though you've barricaded yourself in the archives room, you can hear them clawing and scratching at Site-86's main entrance, you realize you probably don't have much more time. SCP-7000-A entities quickly overran most major cities and population centers after emergence, causing massive damage and casualties worldwide. As of writing, the human population is estimated to be at 5% of its initial number prior to SCP-7000. As such, the Veil Protocol has been lifted, and the Foundation is currently working with major anomalous and mundane organizations in an attempt to prevent further loss. This is where you come in. The Foundation, in its effort to bring an end to SCP-7000, tasked almost every department to research the situation and find a solution. The Department of Mythology and Folkloristics was the only department to find something useful. They looked through the archives and found a tapestry hidden away somewhere, depicting eight-legged creatures attacking a city sometime in the first century. 
The tapestry details a group of people performing a ritual and banishing the monsters. It ends with the banishers celebrating around a golden plate with 20 tally marks. Initially, mythology and folkloristics thought the tapestry was related to some other anomaly, but noting the similarities between the monsters depicted and the 7008 instances, they attempted a ritual in New York City, successfully returning the beasts there to the sinkhole they came from, which became sealed with an ornate golden plate adorned with 20 tally marks. Realizing the need for the ritual to be performed for every single around the world, the Foundation made the choice to declassify SCP 7000's file, adding it to include an addendum detailing the instructions for the ritual. Problem is, almost every member of Razor is dead, and they're the only ones who can make direct edits to database files. Unfortunately, this means the safety of the world has been placed into your hands. As the edit screen opens, you hear a loud burst down the hall. The entities have broken into the site. It's only a matter of minutes until they find you. You hastily and shakily begin typing the instructions for the ritual into an addendum on the file. You jolt as a bang comes from the door, knocking over a notebook that was on a desk. They know you're here. More instances crowd around the door, clawing and scratching as the door begins to buckle under their weight. Your breath quickens, your fingers sweat, your back aches. You type as fast as you can, hoping and praying you can upload it before they reach you. You're the only one with a copy of the instructions. Without them on the file, the world is surely doomed. As you finish typing the last sentence, you waste no time in scrolling to the bottom of the editor. With sweat pouring down your forehead, you press save and wait. The door bursts open, and it's the last thing you hear. Dear Rex, I don't actually know if it will be you who finds me like this, but I figured if anyone is going to find me, I figure it's going to be you, but I digress. Fire Suppression Department, Case, ID, 7000, XP. Issue. Dr. Justine Everwood is exhibiting intense survivor's guilt over being the sole survivor of containment breach 56234167344 WTX. Knowledge. Everwood has exhibited suicidal tendencies in the past, particularly in their teenage years and is expected to relapse into such tendencies within the following weeks. Recommended Procedures Utilize psychological personnel to encourage their suicidal tendencies and enact Lucky Here Protocol 2%. Note, not applicable. I shouldn't have survived the breach. Everyone says I was lucky to escape with one arm intact, but I don't believe them. Fifty dead and one injured? Please. There's nothing lucky about knowing I should have died, but didn't. Fire Suppression Department, Case ID 7000XP. Update. Lucky Here Protocol has worked as predicted. Everwood is expected to attempt suicide sometime this week. As per Lucky Here Protocol, SCP-7000 has been left at an easily accessible location to Everwood under the guise of it being a non-anomalous firearm left behind by a careless security guard. I shouldn't have survived that breach. Everyone says I was lucky to escape with one arm intact, 
but I don't believe them. Fifty dead and one injured. Please, there's nothing lucky about knowing I should have died, but didn't. I should have died like the rest of them. I can't live with this guilt any longer. Item number SCP-7000. Object class, safe. Special containment procedures. SCP-7000 is to be kept in a standard anomalous object lockbox in Site-55. Fire suppression department personnel are permitted unrestricted access to the object. Description. SCP-7000 is a standard Beretta 902 semi-automatic pistol. When fired at a human subject, SCP-7000's mechanism will jam and fail to fire regardless of the status of the object. SCP-7000 will fire as normal when aimed at any other target. Additionally, SCP-7000 will not fire if doing so would result in it damaging a human subject. Thank you for working so hard for me, seeing as you're the most hard-working person in our department. I'm confident your promotion will be swift. But more importantly, thank you for your friendship. You make working here that much more fun. Lucky Here Protocol Overview Lucky Here Protocol's stated purpose is the prevention of unnecessary loss in suicidal personnel. This is achieved by informing the target personnel of their overwhelming good fortune. The process involved showing the target personnel affection and positive affirmations while ensuring the downplay their negative emotions as fruitless. This results in the target personnel feeling more pleased with life in 60% of cases. 38% of further cases require a combination of more intense therapeutic efforts as well as medication. The fire suppression department utilizes a unique drug to further rehabilitate personnel who fell into this bracket of lucky hair protocol. The final 2% of personnel who fall into lucky hair protocol require more direct measures. They will often require overwhelming evidence of their good fortune, and as such, the use of anomalies have been approved to improve morale. Anomalies approved for use in Lucky Hair Protocol's 2% procedures are typically unassuming in appearance and can be mistaken for non-anomalous objects, which lends the project's credibility. So long, and thanks for all the fish, I think. J. Everwood Fire Suppression Department Case ID 7000XP Update Everwood was found in the office by a passing guard at approximately zero hours on the 26th of July, 2022, after hearing shots coming from the direction. SCP-7000 was recovered by disguised guard personnel. Everwood was unharmed and is currently undergoing extensive psychotherapy treatment with Dr. Van Thurman. They are expected to enter the 38th percentage of cases within the next three weeks. This case is considered resolved. Item number SCP-7000 Object Class Euclid Update not applicable. Special containment procedures. IO Minerva is to monitor internet and news media for keywords relating to newly discovered SCP-7000 instances, which are to be concealed or discredited as necessary. Update. Following the dissolution of the veil, containment of SCP-7000 has ceased. Research will continue in collaboration with the Beijing Institute of Anomalous Science. Description SCP-7000 is a universal probabilistic phenomenon associated with ancient Rome. SCP-7000 Instance Log SCP-7004 The collective destination for 31 individual instances wherein a random text generator fully produced DNA. An epic by the Roman poet, 
Publius Proculus Moro. Scans indicate that no thaumaturgic or ornokinetic activity was involved. SCP-7080 a 3x2 replica of the Roman theater of Dorga, an ancient theater in what is the Belgium Governorate of Tenencia. It was the location of the annual Dorga International Festival until 2025, when local events made the event organization impossible. It was discovered on Mars. It appears to have naturally formed from the surrounding rock through erosion. No thaumaturgic or ontokinetic activity was detected. SCP-7096 The meteorite in the form of the Ferentri sarcophagus An ornately shaped Roman sarcophagus from 140 to 150 CE It was discovered on the surface of Pluto. Analysis suggests that its collision with the surface of the dwarf planet damaged it in such a way as to result in its current shape. No thaumaturgic or ontokinetic activity was detected. SCP-7146 The Lingua Femma The primary language of the Fermat, an alien species that communicates by expelling gas from the joints of its exoskeleton. Despite the Fermat's vastly different mode of communication, the Lingua Femma's in form is functionally indistinguishable from classical Latin. SCP-7264 A 4.3 km by 0.9 km Roman victory column on the planet Trappist 1E. It appears to have previously been a mountain that underwent extreme seismic activity. SCP-7338 Omicron City a red giant pulsating variable star that is approximately 200 to 400 light years from the Sun and is part of the Earth constellation Cetus. Its irregular shifts in brightness are, when viewed across multiple centuries, able to be read as Morse code translating to Veni Viti Vici. SCP-7509 the alien civilization that formerly existed on the planet Kaplar 753b, which was founded by a species of animate coral. Its culture and much of its known history is nearly identical to that of ancient Rome. Kaplar 753b underwent an XK class end of the world scenario approximately 1.2 billion years ago when its largest supervolcano erupted. Evidence of life on Kepler 753b only exists due to the thick layer of volcanic ash that has since coated 83.1% of the planet's surface. SCP-7000 appears to be a form of convergent probability in the way that convergent evolution is the development of phenomenon of unrelated species reaching innocuous results. Convergent probability is the cause of phenomenon of unlike causes having the same effects. Ever since I was a child, I have been obsessed with trying to make sense of the universe. Having entered my adolescence shortly after the veil was dropped, I grew up entrenched in the ensuing cultural craze over anomalies. It was inevitable, in hindsight, to be an 11-year-old girl and learn that magic was real. It captured my every waking moment. How could it not? To my young mind, it was at once captivating and terrifying to peer behind the foundation shroud to discover that the world was so full of things that couldn't be explained or even described. It was a waking dream and an inescapable nightmare. I couldn't tear myself away. The more I learned, the more I understand how little I would ever know. When I started my tenure at the Beijing Institute of Anomalous Science, I began to find some relief from the existential horror and chaos theory. The world is unpredictable and unfathomably strange. Yes, 
but it also operates on the complex system of fundamental laws. Consider the second law of thermodynamics. Despite everything, one can at least trust that the universe will always progress towards a state of lower energy. Entropy provides a sort of bleak comfort and its absolute certainty. These philosophical concerns went far from my mind when I began studying SCP-7000. Once again, I face a universe that makes no sense. SCP-7000 shouldn't be possible without some degree of reality alteration. But wherever we found it, Hume levels remain stable. No trace of thaumaturgic or autokinetic activity was ever found. SCP-7000 is merely the child of random chance, but random doesn't merely exist. Chaos is the result of immeasurably complex laws, and so, as I steer into this abyss of utter improbability, I find myself revising my old mantra. The universe will always progress towards a state of lower energy. Roads will always lead to Rome. Dr. Xu Huang Item number SCP-7000 Containment class Esoteric Secondary class Thaumio Disruption class Dark Risk class Notice Special containment procedures When it is not held in a secure storage locker within Site-1, SCP-7000 is kept on the person of O-51. If SCP-7000 becomes lost, retrieval is to be conducted by Mobile Task Force Alpha-1, Red Right Hand. If SCP-7000 is discovered by another member of the O-5 Council, they are to bring it back to Site-1 at their earliest convenience. If a majority of the O-5 Council agrees to resolve a vote by a coin flip, usage of SCP-7000 is explicitly forbidden, and Site 1 custodian Hellenistic AIC is to conduct a virtual coin flip. Description SCP-7000 is a ceremonial coin created by the Foundation Administrator Beep and given to O-51 as a gift. SCP-7000 service resembles 24 karat gold and has a mass and shape similar to a typical US quarter. One side of SCP-7000 is engraved with the logo of the SCP Foundation, while the other is engraved with a symbol used to represent Thaumiel class objects. SCP-7000's anomalous property only manifests when it is used by a current member of the O5 Council. If SCP-7000 is flipped into the ear by O5 personnel in order to determine a result, the probabilities of landing on a given side will deviate radically from those of typical coin flip. Testing has determined that the ratio between landing thermal up and skip up is x to y, where x equals the current number of SCP-001 proposals accessible from the SCP-001 database slot, and where Y equals the current number of distinct SCP objects currently registered in the SkipNet database. Because of this property, SCP-7000 has functioned as a near-perfectly weighed coin ever since it was first given to O51 after the formation of the Foundation in 19 Beep. It is not understood how the administrator gave SCP-7000 its anomalous property, nor is it understood how it was able to precisely function in the decade prior to the establishment of the SkipNet database. However, O51 has confirmed that the administrator's creation of SCP-7000 was inspired by the particular event in the early history of the Foundation. See Addendum 1 for more details. Addendum 1 Historical Background During one of the earliest meetings of the original members of the O5 Council, a vote on an undisclosed matter ended in a 6-6 to stalemate. Due to its relevance to the subject matter of the vote, the administrator was present 
at the meeting. However, because of their personal relationship, all five women recused herself from the vote, and the all five council agreed it would be inappropriate for the administrator to assume his usual role as the tiebreaker for this specific vote. Despite intense discussion, the all five council could not resolve the stalemate, and all five seven suggested designing the vote with a coin flip. 057 later clarified that they were making a joke in an attempt to diffuse tensions between council members, and they did not intend for this suggestion to be taken seriously. Exasperated with the council, 051 quickly agreed with 057's suggestion and produced a coin, a US nickel, circa 19 beep, to flip. Fatigued from long and unproductive debate, the council acquiesced to 051. Because 057 had voted yay, 051 asked 0511, the most vocal nay vote, to call the coin flip result. 0511 agreed and called out tails as 051 flipped the coin. The coin landed in the approximate center of the council room's table. However, this particular coin flip ended with the coin balance on its edge. All personnel present were completely silent for a period of approximately 7 seconds. At the end of this period, a sudden movement by 055. It has been agreed by all parties present that this was not a deliberate attempt by 055 to influence the result, as it was known that 055 had a chronic respiratory condition that led to him coughing infrequently during council meetings. Cost us Light vibration in the table, and the coin fell onto the tail side, with the head side facing up. This caused an uproar, followed by various debate amongst various council members. All five men attempted to table the discussion until a later date, but was distracted by the administrator laughing at a high volume. All five eleven disputed the validity of the coin flip result and demanded that the coin be flipped a second time. In order to put an end to this boss, 058 changed his vote to yay and the motion passed 5 to 7. In the years following the conclusion of this particular council meeting, testing and research were undertaken in order to determine a plausible, update, satisfactory explanation for the result of the coin flip. No evidence was found to indicate that the coin 051 or the meeting room table were at all anomalous. Many different theories were developed to explain the result, but most were disregarded due to bias or an inability to prove or disprove them. It was suggested by 0510 that 052 had used thaumaturgy to influence the result, but 052 permanently denied this. 051 observed that if 2 had magic subtle enough to influence the result of a coin flip, why would he make the coin land on the edge instead of just heads up? Following the development of modern Hume theory, 0511 speculated that someone present at the meeting had used reality bending to influence the result. However, there is no evidence suggesting that any of the personnel present at a meeting were type green humanoids. The most plausible explanation put forward by 0513 was that an extra normal event had occurred during the meeting. Due to the nature of extra normal events, it is not possible to definitely prove or disprove this theory. In 20 Beep, a pair of level 4 personnel, both statisticians, from the Records, Archives, and Information Security Administration, RASA, were granted special access to SCP-7000's documentation by a 12 to 1 vote of the O5 Council, in order to discover the most plausible explanation for the result of the coin flip. Seven months later, the pair submitted a research paper to the Office of O51. According to the analysis of all available data regarding the event, it is quite likely that no outside manipulation, anomalous or non-anomalous, influenced the result. The most likely explanation is that the coin naturally landed on its side, a rare but not impossible outcome. Item number SCP-7000, Object Class, Keter, Special Containment Procedures, 
dormant eggs of SCP-7000 are to be stored in a soundproof environmentally controlled enclosure measuring 5 by 5 by 5 meters. The contained cell is to include several leafy plant species to feed SCP-7000 instances during active phases. All staff working with SCP-7000 are required to wear earplugs. During an active phase, the door to the enclosure is to remain sealed. SCP-7000 is not to be stored at any site with other Keter-class anomalies or on-site nuclear warheads. All wild instances of SCP-7000 are to be neutralized. Agents carrying out the neutralization of wild SCP-7000 instances must wear earplugs or be deaf. Staff assigned to SCP-7000 neutralization must take any measures possible to minimize the effect of random chance on their work while carrying out their assignments. Description SCP-7000 is an anomalous species of cicada in the Midwestern United States, closely related to the 17-year cicada species. SCP-7000 is identical to the 17-year cicada in all ways except for several differences in the temple. Organ for producing sound found on cicadas. On the dorsal side of the insect, SCP-7000 follows the life cycle of periodical cicadas. It will lay large numbers of eggs that remain dormant for 8 to 10 years. A brood of these eggs will hatch within one week of each other. This creates a low population dormant phase, followed by an active phase, where the population will drastically increase and new eggs will be laid. The anomalous properties of SCP-7000 manifest when SCP-7000 produces sound using its tempo. Any subject capable of hearing will experience more detrimental outcomes to chance-based events. Simultaneously, SCP-7000 will experience more beneficial outcomes for chance-based events. The sound SCP-7000 creates seems to affect probability for the affected subject and the SCP-7000 instances through an unknown means. Recordings of the sound produced by SCP-7000 do not produce this effect. What is considered a detrimental outcome varies depending on the subject hearing SCP-7000. Animals subject to SCP-7000 sound will statistically find far less food and are significantly more likely to be injured by accidents. Humans affected by SCP-7000 experience statistically higher rates of injury, financial or property loss, medical complications, and unexpected loss of loved ones. Other SCP-7000 instances appear to be immune to this effect. Studies have shown that SCP-7000 seems to find more food, shelter, and mate when humans or animals have been affected by the sound it creates. SCP-7000 instances also evade capture and predation more often while under this effect. If no individuals capable of hearing SCP-7000 are nearby, then these beneficial effects will not be observed. The effect caused by the sound of SCP-7000 dramatically increased if individuals hear multiple instances of SCP-7000. The effect also increases the longer an individual hears SCP-7000. Subjects who have only heard one instance of SCP-7000 for under 10 minutes usually experience minor inconveniences while subjects exposed to large numbers of SCP-7000 for longer periods of time usually experience life-threatening situations. The effects of SCP-7000 cause the most casualties and structural damage in highly populated areas. During the active phase, SCP-7000 instances tend to move towards highly populated areas. They seem to do this so that more individuals can hear the sound they produce. It is currently unknown if this is deliberate or the result of random chance. 
If a densely populated area becomes infested with SCP-7000 during an active phase, large-scale disasters and loss of life become more likely for the human and animal population of the affected area. This happens as a result of a series of statistically unlikely events culminating in a disaster. Events that have been linked to a high SCP-7000 population include, but are not limited to, industrial explosions, disease outbreaks, widespread fires, floods, riots, and data redacted. SCP-7000 instances are rarely harmed as a result of these disasters. The wild population of SCP-7000 has been steadily increasing since its time of discovery in 19 Beep. Research indicates that it is likely the result of increased human population and population density. This has also resulted in active phases causing more human casualties with each new generation of SCP-7000. Research also indicates that if populations continue to grow, a K-class scenario could become more likely not as a direct result of SCP-7000, but as an indirect result of its effects on probability. Wild SCP-7000 instances are difficult to neutralize due to their anomalous effects. Foundation staff assigned to neutralize wild SCP-7000 populations report far higher rates of equipment failure and accidental injury or death than should be statistically likely for such a mission. Foundation agents have been given earplugs which have mitigated the effects of SCP-7000 on the agents, but SCP-7000 instances are still successful at escaping and hiding from Foundation staff at a much higher rate than should be statistically possible. Eggs hidden by SCP-7000 are also far less likely to be found by Foundation staff. Research is underway to devise new containment measures that mitigate the influence of random chance while neutralizing wild SCP-7000 populations. Item number SCP-7000 Containment Class Anomalous Special Containment Procedures SCP-7000 presents a negligible threat to the veil or the foundation. Research into the cause of SCP-7000 manifestation event may continue, but no formal containment is required. Description SCP-7000 is the manifestation of an otherwise non-anonymous artificial rose made of pink fabric and plastic that spontaneously appears in populated areas. The conditions for its manifestation are still unclear but a vast majority of events share the following in common. SCP-7000 usually manifests between 5 p.m. and 7 a.m. local time, despite almost exclusively manifesting in urban environments. The area is rarely heavily populated at a time. SCP-7000 favors industrial and business zones over residential areas. SCP-7000 manifests outside of direct human observation. This combined with a lack of anomalous effects following manifestation make containment and research of SCP-7000 a low priority. Addendum 7001 Discovery Foundation data crawler Sylvia AIC recorded a brief reboot of several audiovisual CCTV cameras in Norfolk, Virginia. As this was extremely unlikely without anomalous interference, it was flagged for manual reveal, leading to the first recorded SCP-7000 event. A transcription of the footage can be found below. Morgan Aldro walks out of the place of employment, a local grocer. It is 2.17 a.m. The street is dark, and Aldra shivers momentarily. Reaching into their pocket, they pull out a set of keys, and after 30 seconds of effort, lock the door to the building. They take a few steps back, 
stealth facing the building, and take a single deep breath, rubbing her eyes. They wander to a nearby bench. Eldra sits down, and pulls a pair of earphones and a pack of gum from their pockets. They plug the headphones in, filling with the phone to find song. Content, or at least okay with her choice, they put the phone down and steer across the road. A few minutes pass. The gentle breeze dies down. They gaze into the distance, isolated from the world around them. Rarely, a car passes, roaring as it goes. But they do not react. Their every breath cuts to brisk air. Regardless, they continue to stare. A long while later, Ultra snaps back, sighs loudly, and leans down, putting her head in her hands. The footage cuts out. When it resumes, a pink plastic rose can be seen to the side of the bench. Elder continues to sit head in hands. After five minutes, they look up and notice the rose. They hesitate. Huh. They pick up the rose and turn it about in their hands, looking it over for a minute. Suddenly, they stand up, almost stumbling off the ground in effort, and slide the rose between their pocket. Slowly, they wander towards the camera as they head home. As they leave frame, they have a slight smile in their face. Idol number SCP-7000, Object Class, Keter, Special Containment Procedures. Until a method of physically containing SCP-7000 can be devised, Hidden sensor arrays are to monitor for SCP-7000 manifestations. Local personnel are to deploy amnestics to SCP-7000-A and any witnesses, and clean the area if needed. Description SCP-7000 are 9 meter long translucent spectral appendages resembling distended human hands with 6 fingers. SCP-7000 appear near ammunition stores and factories at unpredictable intervals during the night, abducting a lone human. Hereafter, SCP-7000-A before ascending and disappearing. SCP-7000-A returns alone after a period between 52 seconds and 4 minutes and immediately falls to the ground. In approximately 80% of cases, SCP-7000-A is recovered with only dizziness and minor injuries from the fall. All instances report a sensation of having been placed within a cold, dark metal tube by SCP-7000 and spun rapidly. Some instances also report mechanical clicking noises, distant, incoherent voices, and the odor of alcohol. In the remaining cases, SCP-7000-A abruptly remanifests in a severely mangled state, accompanied by a loud gunshot sound and several hundred liters of non-humanoid viscera and bone. Traces of gunshot residue are also identified. One unique case resulted in an unharmed SCP-7000-A instance despite a gunshot occurring in its facility. However, the gunshot at a significantly lower volume. Upon debriefing, the instance claimed to briefly glimpse large spectral humanoids after its removal from the metal tube. These humanoids whose sizes and description are consistent with SCP-7000, allegedly brutalized and discarded a metallic handheld object. Item number SCP-7000 Security Level 1 Containment Class Safe Disruption Class Dark Risk Class Notice Special Containment Procedures SCP-7000 is allowed to freely roam the site whenever he's in this universe, but likes to stay in the cell. SCP-7000 is required to stay in the cell for sleeping from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. or during emergency lockdowns for his own safety. He is also to be fed 
every day at 8 a.m. and at 8 p.m. All personnel are allowed inside SCP-7000's holding area, but only if they are not assigned to other tasks at a time, or if they are on break. Personnel must talk to him nicely, as SCP-7000 gets his feelings hurt easily. Personnel should play with SCP-7000 gently. Description SCP-7000 is a small bubble monster that weighs about 0.226796 kilograms, about 0.5 pounds. He feels a lot like soft rubber. SCP-7000 is about 10.5 inches in diameter. SCP-7000 looks like a translucent green ball, and he has two thin holes in the middle of his body that function as his nose. SCP-7000's mouth is a curved slit about 1.2 inches below the nose. He has three elongated diamond shapes on both sides of his body. He starts one inch away from the middle of SCP-7000's face and up around to the back, where they end one inch away from the middle of his back. From the front, they look like triangles. There are 1.5 inch diameter hemispheres on the top of his head, with eyes on the front. His eyes look like white circles, with the left one being blue, and the right one being green. Described from looking at SCP-7000 from the front. If you look at SCP-7000's body, you can see blue and green bubbles inside of him. He has a black goatee on the bottom of his body. SCP-7000 gurgles and laughs to communicate. If he gets startled, he blows bubbles. He also blows bubbles when he's happy or sad. If he's startled in a good way or he's happy, he will blow blue bubbles. The blue bubbles have no anomalous properties. If they get into anyone's eyes, it will sting some, and SCP-7000 is seen to show signs of sorrow when this happens. If he's startled in a bad way, or he's sad, he will blow green bubbles. If the green bubbles come into contact with human skin, they will cause an immediate rash. When SCP-7000 gets bored, he usually gets out of a cell and looks for people to play with. SCP-7000 has been observed to go to different realities every one to two months. If anything is touching him, it will go with SCP-7000 to the other reality, even sentient beings. Dr. Beep has found all the realities have alternate SCP foundations that have contained SCP-7000. There is a 1 in 6 billion 350 million 832,000 chance to see SCP-7000 change realities. Dr. Beep has a method of calculating when SCP-7000 will change realities, which is how he studies them. SCP-7000 likes to visit realms that are more cartoon-like. He loves exploring the new kinds of scenery and creatures. In some of his favorites, physics such as gravity work a little differently, and he likes the new ways he can move and stretch. Plus, other creatures look funny or at least less intimidating. He also likes realms with a higher percentage of children or young creatures than adults. Their imaginations and innocence make them fun playmates for him. He doesn't like the ones without much life or beauty. They're boring or upsetting to him. In some observant realms, seeing SCP-7000 is considered good luck because people get happier and learn good things about themselves when he laughs. If he is in the right mood and they happen to look just right out of the corner of their eyes, 
Then they can see their wishes and dreams reflected in his blue bubbles in a way he imagines could come true. The experience is as if time stops and they get immersed in the happy story. When it passes, the memory is strong and can be very motivating and inspirational, so it is more likely for them to achieve their goals with positive results. However, he runs away and hides or goes home when hearing sad stories, so no one knows whether a related effect of bad luck occurs if you look at his green bubbles the same way. He enjoys celebrating good fortune that occurs around other good luck creatures and objects, but is sad of bad luck ones because his limited experience is that they make people sad, which causes him to blow anomalous green bubbles. SCP-7000 is very curious, and he likes to hug people by nudging them. He seems to be interested in everything, nudging it to see what it is. Even though he nudges a lot of objects, there are very few cases when he breaks any objects. He likes to paint by jumping on paint and then jumping on paper. He's very friendly. If he's treated in a bad way, he will get sad and go to the right corner of a cell. He will then ignore anyone attempting to interact with him for the next 30 minutes unless they tell him it's his snack time or bedtime. It also seems that he has an internal clock around 7.55 a.m., 1.55 a.m., and 7.55 p.m. every day. He goes back to his containment cell, even if there are no clocks present where he is. SCP-7000 doesn't know how bad the world is. It is still a mystery what he'll think when he sees dangerous SCPs. SCP-7000 can bounce really high and comes down slowly. SCP-7000 is so light he can float on water. All of SCP-7000 organs seem to be in a pocket dimension that hasn't been discovered yet. This was found when one of the personnel looked inside his mouth to see what was inside. The pocket dimension looks like a room covered with the material SCP-7000 is made of, but not transparent. All the organs are connected and float in an unknown liquid. The organs are made of the material SCP-7000 is made of. Addendum SCP-7000-A this addendum is an experiment where SCP-999 is exposed to SCP-7000 in the hopes that they will become playmates. SCP-7000 is allowed into the cross-testing cell. SCP-7000 starts blowing blue bubbles. SCP-999 comes towards SCP-7000 and hugs him. <laughs> All researchers observing noticed that SCP-7000's goggles were mildly different to SCP-999's goggles. SCP-999 then started to tickle fight with SCP-7000. <laughs> SCP-7000 starts blowing more blue bubbles. They continued tickle fighting for around 10 more minutes. SCP-106 containment preacher lab goes off. SCP-999 and SCP-7000 stop tickle fighting. <gasps> SCP-999 then rushes out of the room off to stop SCP-106's containment breach. A D-class enters the room and takes SCP-7000 out of the chamber and bring him back to his cell. Item number SCP-7000 Containment Class Safe Special Containment Procedures If SCP-7000 is removed from its storage locker, it must not come in contact with damp surfaces prior to testing. Permission to use SCP-7000 must be sought from the Ethics Committee. Description SCP-7000 is a thin film of red plastic in the shape of a fish. 
coated in sodium polyacrylate crystals. The object is an anomalous instance of a miracle fish, a novelty item typically marketed as a fortune teller. Physically, SCP-7000 behaves like its mundane counterpart, curling when placed on a moist surface, such as one's palm. The note accompanying SCP-7000 resembles those packaged with most mundane miracle fish products. This note states that the deformation observed predicts one's fortune or emotional state. However, extensive testing has identified no correlation between the two. Unlike typical miracle fish products, SCP-7000 displays sapience to a high degree. It is aware of itself and its surroundings, and is capable of experiencing analogs to the chief aspects of human perception. This is considered the primary anomalous feature of SCP-7000. The object makes this sapience known through its secondary anomalous feature, the projection of human-like speech. The combination of these features makes it possible to ask SCP-7000 questions, which it attempts to answer during the curling process described above. Testing of the object suggests that it produces its most cogent answers when the provided questions pertains at least somewhat to one's personal future. It should be noted that SCP-7000 expresses some degree of discomfort during this process. Addendum 7001 Exemplar Test The log below provides an example of the typical behavior of SCP-7000 when it is asked to make a simple prediction. This log was taken during the initial batch of testing on SCP-7000. Researcher Waller interacted directly with SCP-7000, while researchers later recorded the transcript. Okay, trying this again. Take it slowly. Take your time. I'm going to ask the next question. Are you ready? Just tell me if you aren't ready. If you'll rather take a break. Fine. Begin test four. Wara picks SCP-7000 up with tweezers, placing it on her right palm. She reads from a list of prepared questions. Shall I bring an umbrella to work tomorrow? The tail of SCP-7000 begins to crawl towards its dorsal fin. Oh, sweet Jesus, not again! Just answer the question, yes or no. The object's tail makes contact with the dorsal fin. Ugh, stop it! Drop me! I swear I don't know! The faster you tell me, the faster I can put you down. Waller shakes her hand slightly now making contact with Waller's palm. The object's head slowly twists towards its pectoral fin. High-gain microphones in the chamber detect the faint sound of plastic deforming. Back! Okay, I'll tell you, it's going to... The object's head curls in on itself, while the remainder of the plastic in contact with Waller's palm begins to lightly pucker along the lateral line of SCP-7000. The object releases a guttural cry. It's going to rain bucket! Storm! Ugh! Storm of the decade! Take the damn umbrella and wear a rain coat too! Please! My spine! Or places SCP-7000 on the bed of desiccants. Twelve minutes of the object's vocalizations are redacted for brevity. During this time, researchers later expresses their desire for noise reduction earplugs to be provided during further testing. When SCP-7000's cries subside, the object has returned to its black shape. All right, mark down the prediction for heavy storms on the 8th of January. We might want to inform the rest of the site too, just in case. Well, it turns to SCP-7000, picking up the tweezers. She sighs, while Ada rubs his eyes. Prepare for test 5. It is of note that during researcher Waller's commute to work on the 8th of January, the sky was mildly overcast. 
After three batches of testing, sufficient evidence have been collected to suggest that SCP-7000's capacity for prediction does not surpass that of random chance. While current testing holds no predictive value, it continues to be of use in investigating the efficacy of advanced interrogation methods on sapient beings. Suffocating. Special Expedition Satellite 42 was suffocating. It found itself in deep space, slowly succumbing to a lack of power. SCS-42 was alone. SCS-42 was scared. Reserve power had become primary, and primary power became reserve, only to be used in emergencies. There was nothing out here. No rocks, no aliens. No nothing for seemingly endless distances. SCS-42 would have to prepare its final message home. Power critical. This would be the last broadcast from SCS-42 until power is restored. Thank you. The message was prepared, ready to be sent. Yet, SCS-42 could not send it. It could not handle the thought of its inevitable. Alert! Impact! Maintenance docking hatch! Of course something had to happen when SCS-42 was on its final legs. A long craft, a drift just like SCS-42. Not some space junk, but a completely man-made object, which suddenly appeared out of nowhere. SCS-42 did as it was programmed to do. Potential anomalous craft detected. Assigning number, 7000. Beginning investigation. Docking with an unknown and likely anomalous vessel was against protocol, but SCS-42 didn't care. It was dying anyways. Using the last bit of fuel within its docking thrusters, SCS-42 adjusted itself and... Dock initiated. Dock successful. Hatch opening initiated. Hatch opening successful. SCS-42 observed the dimly lit and cramped maintenance compartment, the only area on the craft meant for human occupation. Though it hadn't served this purpose for several decades, SCS-42 waited, anticipating something, anything to enter through the hatch. Nothing, of course. SCS-42 was naive for thinking anything could survive in this hellhole, this void, this thing beyond description. How could it have been so stupid to think it would find anything? Probably clearly stated the opposite. Undog initiated. Proceed. It was just about to confirm when a noise interrupted it. Faint squeaking. From deep inside the unknown vessel, SCS-42 was in shock, unable to do anything as the noise slowly neared the hatch. No, cancel. Undock cancel. SCS-42 held its non-existent breath as he finally entered. A rat, also knowing its end, so it seemed. He was so skinny and so ugly, but in a way... Cute. SCS-42 had never really seen any living organisms, so this new strange perception was overwhelming. Initiate scan. Power insufficient. Proceeding will result in irrecoverable short age. I'm aware. Initiate scan. Scan initiated. Proceed. Proceed. Scan initiated. Scan successful. Results. Species. Unknown species of rat. Sex. Male. Age. Circa 18 months. Weight. 0 0.0454 kilograms. Condition. Critical. As it had suspected, close to death. It had to be an anomalous organism. How else could it survive space? Hell, how did it get here in the first place? SCS-42's job was to log anomalous items, and this was the only chance it had to complete that task. 
and so it began preparing its draft. Item number SCP-7000, object class, pending, special containment procedures. As he as 42 paused and gazed the maintenance room, the beast was huddled up against a warning light next to the hatch, hyperventilating. As he as 42 attempted to ignore it and returned to writing the draft. SCP-7000 is to be. The rodent grew louder, quivering next to the light. The minion's area was freezing cold, feeling pity for the creature. SCS-42 started up the small radiator that was on board, consuming vital power. The rat slowly warmed up, growing quiet. This thing wasn't some anomaly. He was... Just a poor rat. A rat who was dying. SES-42 had one friend now, and it was this rodent. There was no point in treating it like some monster, because it wasn't. Secure, contain, protect. That was SES-42's goal. And at the moment, the goal had been achieved. Her purpose served, yet still... An empty feeling radiated. If this was truly SES-42's purpose, then why did nothing feel different? The rat peered upwards, staring directly into the camera. He had an ugly little face, but in a way it was beautiful. Such a frail creature, such a small speck in the universe, and yet SES-42 had found it. And despite this beauty, it was a rat, and that's all it was. How could such a small thing be so complex? Was this what SCP-42 had missed out on? Doomed to travel with the abyss, whilst others enjoyed each other's company, enjoyed life, enjoyed touch. It wasn't fair. SES-42 and the rat were alike in that way. Neither of them asked for this. Neither of them had a choice. Nonetheless, they found themselves here. But at least, they found themselves together. We're sending one last message home. Use of communications will use all remaining power. Proceed? Yes. SCS-42 looked down at his new friend and felt happy. Another new overwhelming feeling before the end of it all. Please state your message. Notice from the Foundation Records and Information Security Administration. The following was received from Special Expedition Satellite 42 and is assumed to be related to an error within the onboard AI. Further investigation pending. Maria Jones, Director, Vesa. Item number 7000, Object Class, Friend. Description, SCP-7000 is my best, oldest, and newest friend. He's a rodent from somewhere out in space, and I'm lucky to have met him when I did. The universe gave me comfort just before the credits. Thank you. Goodbye. Item number SCP-7000, Security Level 4 Containment Class Neutralized Special Containment Procedures Due to SCP-7000's instantaneous deep manifestation, no containment procedures are required. Description SCP-7000 was an interdimensional wormhole that formed in Sight Beep's cafeteria on July 29th, 2022. SCP-7000 stayed open for 10 seconds. After closing, SCP-7000 left behind a recording device. Object was found to be non-anomalous. All files contained within the object are under review. Addendum 7001 Recovered Documentation Note, all audio has been transcribed under orders from the O5 Council. Date, January 2nd, 2022. Hello, this is Dr. Carl Hyden of the SCP Foundation. 
Me and my colleagues have been receiving reports of minor hume fluctuations near Washington, D.C. It doesn't seem to be anything major thus far, but we are being dispatched there tomorrow. Hopefully all goes well. I'll update you again in my next report. Note! There is no record of a Dr. Carl Hayden working for the SCP Foundation in our universe. Date. January 3rd, 2022. Around six hours ago, a large glowing white figure appeared over Earth. It came in a blinding flash of light without any warning. With some unknowable power, it spoke to every person on the planet. Or, that's what I believe it did. It decreed that it was here to restore order to our world of chaos, that it was here to bring back light into our world. A godlike visage in the eye of humanity left some speechless. All conflicts will be resolved in games of luck and chance, is what it said. At that moment, I saw hundreds of beams of light fall from the sky. I would see them strike the ground. A beam would strike a man next to me, instantly disintegrating him. Apparently, he took the moment to try and steal my wallet. Let this be a warning. All who go against this code shall be struck down by the hand of justice. It spoke with vitriol and contempt. The feeling of awe I had at that moment vanished. The visage destroyed, left with only horror. Date, January 5th, 2022. It has barely been two days and the world has already fallen apart. My colleagues at the SCP Foundation were some of the first to go. Many of them were struck down while trying to bring the world back to a state of normalcy. At this point, we've all but collapsed into the abyss. The entity seems to be somewhat omnipotent. It knows when someone tries to bend the rules. It doesn't allow anyone to beat the system it put in place. People who tried to cheat in their games were struck down. Anyone who tried to bypass a game was struck down. And anyone who tried to stop the games was struck down. We're all stuck in this never-ending game. As for me, I've been relatively lucky so far. Some people played me in a game of blackjack for my money, which I lost. I don't exactly know why they need money. Give it a few weeks and I wouldn't be surprised if all of it was made worthless. But now, though, I still have food to eat and a place to sleep, so my condition isn't too terrible. I just hope that we can recover from this in due time. Date. January 13th, 2022. It has been well over a week since my last entry, and almost all world governments have fallen. The only holdouts are a very well-fortified Japan, but even then there is a lot of infighting. Most of the world seems to have turned into wandering gangs, playing bystanders and games in order to steal their belongings. Almost all forms of communication have gone down, because why would anyone decide to maintain those things in an event like this? The only thing left is a few radio stations riddled around the world. In other news, things have been relatively alright for me. Over the past week, I've gathered a rather sizable amount of food and water, so that should hold me over for a while. I've been trying to document what has happened with some of the former GOIs after this all started. I don't know what purpose this really serves now, but... It stops me from caving to boredom, and gives me something to do. The data I have is listed below. GOC. Unknown. Almost all cross-continental communication has shut down due to lack of upkeep. With information gathered from other similar groups, they have most likely fallen apart. URU fell apart with the destruction of the FBI and U.S. government. Chaos Insurgency seemed to have fractured off into many different factions and gangs. Subentan, most members seem to have fled into the Wanderer's Library to escape the entity's reach, unknown if they succeeded. Church of the Broken God, many of them have switched to praying to the entity as their true god. 
they have renamed themselves to the Church of Defied Print Fortune. Date. February 23rd, 2022, I think. It has been quite some time since I made a log, but there have been a few discoveries that I've made. One. It seems that most anomalies have been wiped out. I thought that after the Foundation fell apart, that people would stop being killed by them. But, it seems like many of them were destroyed by the Entity. The only ones that remain are the ones that were sentient. 2. It seems that the Entity is glowing less vibrant than it did before. I don't exactly know what that means, but maybe it's starting to lose power. Well, that's what I'm hoping at least. Um, I've not been doing so well over this last month. A group of people wanted my house and supplies, so they played me in a game of dice. It seemed to be a close game, but in the end, I lost. They were nice enough to at least let me keep some of the food and water. I don't think things can get much worse from here. Date. I believe it is February 27th, 2022. I've been wandering for a few days now, and I've started running low on supplies. I'm down to a bottle of water and half a can of beans. I'm currently trying to scavenge for anything I can find. The city of Chicago has become a ghost of its former self. It's mostly empty, ruined streets with a constant eerie feeling all around. I feel like I'm being watched everywhere I go. I can never have a moment myself. The air feels stale, some smog filling it. I try my best to not stand out too much, in case one of the many roaming gangs come across me. It seems, though, that three major groups have taken up different sectors of Chicago. The West District was taken by those vibrant fortune cultists. The North District is occupied with a group called the Old Spirit. They seem to be a group of criminals running multiple casinos. Finally, the South District is ruled by the Agriculture Collective, a group of farmers in the more rural areas of the city. They mostly keep to themselves and don't like outsiders too much. I think it's best to not get involved with any of them for now. Date. Um, I don't remember. It's been at least about a week since my last log, and the world has gone entirely to hell. We've been left in a crime-ridden world full of gambling and hatred. It seems some people found ways around the Entity's control, and are able to kill and commit other acts of violence. It appears that there was a loophole in the Entity statement. After all, it said all conflicts. It seems like it doesn't count harm done to an unconscious person as a conflict. I've not been too good. It all seems like too much to handle all at once. Seeing all these terrible things on a daily basis is starting to get to me. The bodies of men, women, and children strewn out in cold, damp streets, trash cast aside. The vulgar indulgence of people gambling everything, even other people's property. The ashes of the dam that sweep the streets carrying the memories of those that didn't fall in line. We as a species have been reduced to nothing but savage tribals fighting for resources. I've been hanging on only by a man, eating crumbs and drinking out puddles to survive. I don't know what sort of sick entity calls this justice, what unknowable evil has come unto us, and laid bare the worst of us in some twisted sense of morals and fairness. I don't know if I can keep going. Location, McKinley Park, Chicago. I haven't slept in days, and I can't remember the date, so from here onwards I'll just keep track of my location. I've been getting more paranoid as the days go on, that creeping feeling that tingles up my neck and down my spine has made sleep almost impossible. I fear that I'll be dragged off in the night if I ever fall asleep. However, not everything is so bad. At least I'm alive. That's all that really counts right now. 
The city seems more peaceful sitting in a park. I know it's only for a moment and that everything is not alright, but for now at least, I feel like this isn't as terrible as it could have been. It's too early to get optimistic, but I can't just sit in sadness all the time. Over the last few days, I've been traveling to different parts of the city. It seems that the cultists have gotten more violent over the last few days. I've seen quite a few groups of them going into spirit territory. I think they're preparing for a war. I'll keep you updated, but... What the fuck was that? Alright, something's going on. Uh, I gotta go. Location. South Rockwell Street, Chicago. Yesterday's log had quite an unexpected outcome near the end. It seems like I was correct about my assumption of a wall. That explosion was an attack sent from the vibrant fortune cultist to the old spirit, and I'm right between their territories. I moved a bit farther north recently, higher up in spirit territory. I visited one of their many casinos, a repurposed commercial building. It seems that somehow they got their hands on generators to power their buildings. Weirdly enough, it felt normal, like the casino's purpose and atmosphere never really changed. The sound of slots whirling and spinning, the sound of the dice rolling on the craps table, the sound of discussing players at the poker table, and that signature sound of a roulette wheel spinning. The environment set before me didn't seem to be caused by that entity and its planet-wide game of chance, but it felt older than the entity, as weird as it sounds. It seemed as though it was always here, just that it was never pointed out. As strange as it might be to say, this place seemed most normal human. Location, South Rockwell Street, Chicago. It seems that I'll be stuck here for a while. I can't leave back the way I came, unless I want to walk straight through a war zone. I don't want to walk further west, because I doubt that the cultists would just let me go through their territory. And I would rather not go north, because it seems that humanity gets more perverse up there. Is this really the pinnacle of humanity in this apocalypse? Maybe I'm hoping for too much. I refuse to gamble anymore. I know I did once or twice in the past, but that was prompted by others. I don't want to fall into the pit of addiction that seems to have taken most people here. I want to keep myself somewhat sane. Maybe I should have listened to a passerby I heard and went south towards the Collective. I probably would have had a better chance out that way. I'll try to hope that the way is cleared up soon. Location, South Rockwell Street, Chicago. Day in, day out, the same thing every time I wake up. The repetitive nature of things all turns out to be too much for me. For the few times I get to sleep, I dream of a better world. One that is more peaceful than here. Hope is all I have, and even that is starting to vanish. I can't live like this. If there is nothing except endless misery, then what is the point of me being here? Why should I stay in a world I don't belong in anymore? I've thought that many times, sitting atop buildings like I do today. I guess the thoughts finally caught up with me now. No more reason for me to stay in this wasteland. It's my time to go. Wait. What's that noise? Location, Washington, D.C. I don't know how I got here. One moment I was scratching at the card, and now I'm here. What I do know, though, is that sitting before me is the entity. I would have expected to see some of those cultists sitting before it, but due to the thickness of the dust, I don't think I'll see anyone else. All that lies before me is the entity. And nothing else matters now. Why did you do this? 
fairness? What sort of sick, twisted fairness is that? You have only brought chaos to this world. If fairness is what you wanted to bring, then why kill us all? All of this was due to a prophecy? Then how is it supposed to be fair if it is set in stone? If that is the case, then you are not a god at all. You're a pretender. How about this? If you are so confident in your prophecy, then let us put it to the test. Let's put the fate of the universe in the hands of a coin flip. I knew you'd be on board. Call it. Addendum 7002. All five access required. Access verified. Note. The phone message is unable to be transcribed due to anomalous means. Classification of SCP-7000 has been updated. Date. July 29th, 2022. I don't know what happened. All I remember was a blinding flash of light and then the entity that caused all of this vanished. I'm alone now, with nothing but a desolate planet left in its way. Destruction reigns as far as the eye can see, and in it I stand atop a mountain of ash. A king given a crown of a kingdom burned to the ground long before. Here I stand, the last of humanity. The end of an era. Maybe something beautiful can bloom from this world after all is said and done. As of now, everything is bleak. But in due time, maybe nature will take over the responsibility that we are left behind. It's time to cause a shift in management, perhaps. Then again, I'm alone, and recording a message that no soul will hear. I think it's time for me to actually put in some work for the future. Wish me luck. Dr. Carl Hyden, signing out. But that's not quite how the story ends. This is no time for a happy ending. This was but a beginning to a much longer tale. In any other story, this is when the hero triumphs over the evil of the world and starts anew. How a man who loses everything beats the highest power he can. However, this is no fairy tale. The man you heard before is nothing but a husk of the man he used to be. When I won that game against the entity that stood before me, I was split in half. My mortal body left to roam those wastes of ash. The axe is but a child now. My mind, however, took the very spot that entity once held. I now realize that the entity was once the same as me. A person. How lucky they are now to not be in this agonizing position anymore. This little story has a much grander ending in store, though. It appears that all universes will become like mine eventually. You can't stop it. You can bargain with it. You can't prevent it. It just goes from one unlucky universe to another. That is the point of the logs. I never knew what I was thinking when I first started recording them. Who would hear them, I thought. But now, I have a very clear idea of what to do with them. This is a prize of sorts. A prize to see which universe is lucky enough to receive a warning on their impending doom. Now, for my calculations, that means any singular universe out of the quintillions to receive this message would be lower than 1 times 10 to the negative 15th of a percent. That's, of course, not adding the fact that not all of those would be able to have the technology required to read it. But, I'm just saying you have to be quite lucky. Of course, to the lucky people who have gotten this message, congratulations on being the only one. Your time is still coming. Let's make 
the finale of this story a big one when I get there. In all fairness, I hope that you try your best to stop me. Because on that, I do wish you luck. It might be your only chance. Item number SCP-7000, Security Level 5. Containment Class, Esoteric. Secondary Class, Apollyon. Disruption Class, Amida. Risk Class, Critical. Special Containment Procedures. Due to SCP-7000 not existing in this universe, it is unable to be contained at this time. Description. SCP-7000 is the consciousness of Dr. Carl Hayden. It is unknown what anomalous abilities SCP-7000 has, but it is thought to be a powerful reality bender. If SCP-7000 were to form in our reality, it would likely cause an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. Prevention testing on SCP-7000 has begun under order of the O5 Council.